Hello, everyone. Um, in a similar case as Juicy's, my initial plan was uh, different. I was thinking about talking about archives and how I do my work and how I approach the problem of archiving. But after all these things happened in the last month, um, I lost motivation to do so. So it turned out to be a totally different uh, presentation and uh, it started uh, with me brainstorming about what happened and also questioning about uh, the kind of abstractions I do in my work and if they still make sense uh, like many artists I know also question about if there is a different kind of art that will be done after this protest or, or if people will change their approach. Um, so since I'm uh, most interested with technology as a language, which I will shortly explain what I mean by that, uh, I took that as a loose framework and um, started uh, kind of like a, a associative narrative out of that. So in, in a way it's similar to what happens in these uh, forums after the protests where people come up and talk about their experiences. Uh, so rather than building a theory or making analysis, this is more like my reflection. Uh, so why do we, uh, why do I make a title like the language of technology? Uh, and why do I use computer metaphors as my framework. Uh, the starting point is the idea that technology always reflects to society when it becomes fully understood. And in this case, this is an ancient uh, model for the movement of the planets based on gears. Um, this is for a long time, uh, the universe uh, was perceived by us by a clockwork mechanism and since there was no such thing as motors in that in those times uh, that gearbox was somewhat uh, functioned by a force outside like God uh, but then a different model came out with the industrial revolution which is the uh, ther thermodynamics and the steam engine uh, and entered the um, the social world uh, after the mechanism is abstracted and became like this, which uh, consisted of a reservoir and a difference which can be exploited and the rules for this exploitation. And a lot of examples about the 19th century social science reflect that like a Darwin, and when we talk about Darwin, we have a reservoir of <coughs> populations difference of fitness and a procedure to direct the circulation of naturally selected species. For Marx, it's a reservoir of the capital, difference of class uh, and the circulation of uh, commodities and labor. And for Freud, it's a <coughs> reservoir of unconscious desire, difference of sex and the symptoms and fantasies that circulate. And for, for the current technologies that enter our life, many argue that it's the internet uh, and the technologies derived from that, basically the, the language of the networks. And uh, the first time we started talking about, uh, talking using the language of networks was when the Mosaic uh, web browser uh, came out. And after that, there was a boom in the 90s and everything with the E prefix became very trendy and that also led to economic boom, but it was such a bubble that it finally collapsed. But that bubble actually helped to get this language into the mainstream. Uh, and we all became more acquainted with that terminology. Some examples of that would be uh, the hacker ethic reached the mainstream, the open source movement came out, 
Books like Cathedral and the Bazaar, Open Voices, Cool Train Manifesto were published, Matrix was released, and the Linux operating system was uh, recognized as a work of art in, in Arts Electronica Festival. And um, I argue that this language of technology that we currently talk about is not only networks, but uh, it's networks with uh, computers. It's also important to consider how the computers work. Because networks always existed there, like in this case, the food web or the old trading networks. But for computers, uh, we have other things that come into play. Uh, if there's a, uh, there's a very minimal definition of the computer in Wikipedia. Uh, it's a general purpose device that can be programmed to carry out a finite set of arithmetic <coughs> or lo logical operations. Uh, now this definition can take us potentially back uh, into very abstract terms like just numbers. But rather than uh, going onto an ontology of numbers, I extend this uh, into a pure raw numbers versus numbers that have meaning or have a kind of like a meta uh, symbolic level, which is information. Now, uh, I will come on to that difference again. Uh, now, this is a picture from, uh, fr from a computer programming tutorial about object-oriented programming. Now, if you look at this, it looks very uh, Platonian in the sense that we have an ideal, uh, kind of like a, on the left, uh, something from the world of ideas, and uh, the right one is an instance. So, in a way, a lot of the philosophical concepts have become uh, practical methods in computer language. And uh, here I will quote uh, Alexander Galloway's interface effect. The computer is dramatically unlike other media. Instead of facilitating the metaphysical arrangement, the computer does something quite different. It simulates the metaphysical arrangement. A, a brief reference to object-oriented programming will help illustrate the problems surrounding the remediation of metaphysics itself. On the one hand, an idea, on, on the other, a body. On the one hand, an essence, on the other, an instance. On the one hand, the ontological, on the other, the ontical. The medium of computer is being. Now, um, my next uh, analogies will be, actually, I will start with this, uh, about a very simple diagram of the uh, architecture of computers, where there is a central brain that communicates with memory. And the simple form is, uh, there is one type of memory, which is uh, what we call program memory and data memory. If we kind of anthropomorphize this, that would be like uh, a program memory is what the computer does, and data memory is what the computer thinks or remembers. Now, in today's computers, these are mostly separated. So I will take this structure as the structure of my narrative and start with the data memory as the first part, which is about representation and uh, our perception of the world. Now, uh, if we talk about data, I will shortly mention that. Uh, it's, uh, when we say raw data, it's unorganized facts that are not processed yet. So in, in Latin, data, data comes from the given, like exactly the, in the Turkish translation. Uh, and it has no meaning. But when it becomes processed and organized, becomes uh, put into context, becomes information. So in this case here, uh, we have pure numbers presented in different ways. But on the right, uh, this could have formed uh, a story based on what the symbols mean. So that would be information. But a better uh, explanation would be pixels in a, uh, in, on a screen are actually just numbers, but 
they can be interpreted as, as an image. Uh, but to go further on the Galloway's uh, interface effect that I took many, uh, many of these concepts from, uh, stemming from the different Latin root, information means the act of taking form or being put into form. So in contrast to data, information stresses less a sense of presence and giving forth and a more, and more a plastic adaptation. Adoption, I'm sorry. Adoption of shape. So he relates the, the form in information as data which acquires a form, becomes information. Now, um, here it's the recipe and uh, what you made with the recipe. It's a very similar thing as uh, you write code to program and then you run the code and that becomes the result. But also, there is a different thing going on here that uh, the recipe is mostly if you don't modify, there is one recipe for a certain uh, for a certain food. But every time you make it, it becomes different instance, uh, and that's similar to music scores uh, versus orchestral performances, and uh, or image file that looks different on specific monitors or projector, projectors or different on printed paper. Uh, so we can even expand the meaning of data and information using this, uh, the raw part as, as the one uh, and the instances become related with the information. And in similar, a few similar concepts, I'm just throwing some concepts now, uh, is the top-down versus bottom-up relationships. Uh, and it's uh, when, that's a very, very uh, basic thing that we can see in many things in nature, from nature to business to basically everything. Uh, we can also name these analytic versus synthetic that you either break down things or gather things uh, from bottom up yeah, even in politics there's we talk about bottom up democracy for example uh, so that's also how our brains work in many ways that we process data and then what we have already in our memory interacts with them. So in this case, the top-down, bottom-up, bot <coughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> yeah, the top-down and bottom-up processes uh, have formed the feedback loop in between. So that uh, gives us more efficient results. Now, after all these concepts uh, that might have been a little bit unconnected, uh, but I'm jumping uh, 60 years uh, back in time. And uh, there was a, a PhD thesis written uh, in 1953. By, uh, it, the title was The Theory About the Procedures Up to the Ignition in the Diesel Engine, written by uh, Nejmetin Erbakan, this guy. Um, he was considered a very bright mechanical engineer, later became uh, introduced, actually, the introducer of political Islam in Turkey. And uh, in this thesis, he talked a lot about all the details inside the diesel engine. And he uh, found ways to measure uh, little drops, how they, the paths of these drops and how that actually affects the functioning of the motor, the, all the details. This is a drawing from his, his thesis then. And meanwhile, uh, at the same year in Ankara, there is another guy who, who was writing art criticism and poetry. So that might, uh, to me that was interesting that you know, those two guys were, had nothing to do with politics at that time. And 
uh, one of them was looked like if you didn't know them looked like the man of reason this guy more like the man of you know poetics and uh, so this he would turn out to be uh, the first prime minister to to have the um, left wing first left wing majority government and 20 years later they would together form a coalition government and uh, invade cyprus uh, so <laughs> uh, this is um, Arjuna from Bhagavad Gita. Uh, that was uh, one of his favorite characters, actually. He was uh, very much into uh, the Hindu uh, mythology and the narratives. And in many of his political decisions, he said to, uh, to actually see, uh, see Bhagavad Gita as a guide. For example, in this case, this is uh, Arjuna with Krishna together. And uh, Krishna kind of guides him into the war and gives him moral advice. And all these moral advice were taken by, by him as... Uh... <laughs> now I'm uh, jumping back to, to Ervakam. Um, in his book uh, about Islam and knowledge in 1969, he said, in the West, the succession of ideas and thought have been based on negation. When we look at the succession of ideas in the East, we see all Islamic scholars confirming the ones preceding them. So that's very interesting observation by him. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, because here he talks about, I mean, uh, completely against the scientific method, which, is, uh, which consists of negative feedback. So you have a hypothesis, and then you test it against the predicted uh, results, and take the difference and feed it back to the hypothesis to circulate and make it closer and closer to the reality. Uh, but what, uh, so a similar thing about negative feedback would be body temperature, you compare and then fit the result. But what he talks about is more like a positive feedback, which is in fact what is underlying uh, in uh, physical phenomena like explosions or instability, like in this case, bird and population, or panic in, in this case, if you have more cattle the le level of panic increases. Uh, so maybe uh, that, that was one of the things that made me think why he, he could, was it a misunderstanding or did he think that it was like a diesel motor that explosion, once it's controlled, can actually run the system? Uh, so, but all in all, it's, the motivation, we know what the motivation was, uh, confirmation, uh, because uh, the need for confirmation came from his belief, in a way, that uh, he had a given fact that the unity of God or something like that. So this is very similar to the uh, point in Islamic philosophy, which is illustrated in many uh, also in Islamic patterns, but the starting point is a unity a point, and then you drive a, a you draw um, you first uh, draw uh, draw a point, and then you uh, draw a circle around it. So the circle forms from the unity, and then each point on the circle form other circles. Uh, so that's a top-down kind of approach in that sense, that you don't look at the facts and build up. Uh, from that, but you have an unquestionable truth at the beginning. Now, as opposed to that, uh, I will quote from Ejevit, if humanity cannot use the freedom that poetry provides, then language loses its function as a tool for humans, and humans become the tool for language. Or another one, I started using poetry to form my own ideas. I threw away most of my older poems. They were written 
only at the threshold of poetry. I could only enter inside poetry once I became a politician. So uh, he also argued against the ideas that poetry is some kind of empty, uh, empty useless uh, action. Uh, he called it useful emptiness, quoting Lao Tzu. We turn clay to make a vessel, but it is on the space where there is nothing that the usefulness of the vessel depends. Now, I, don't, I didn't know how to interpret all these, really, but maybe it, there is a... Uh, I uh, find too much meaning all, in all these, like <laughs> Apollo and Dionysus kind of connection between these two guys, but I have doubts about calling Ege with Dionysus. And, uh, but still, um, there is definitely a tension and there is definitely, when I make all these observations, something missing in both and trying to replace it with the wrong, uh, wrong things. Uh, because there is, on one hand, form, harmony and control, on the other hand, access, desire, uh, or the desire to build on one side or to have fun on the other side or to break rules. One of them is sun and uh, reason. The other one is ecstasy and also the night. So music and poetry. But also, more importantly, to connect it to previous concepts is one of them is top-down approach is dominant. The other one, bottom-up approach, is dominant. And the feedback is missing in between. So that's my observation here. Now, um, a few questions would be, does this kind of tension exist in our current situation? Or is all these things I talked about too general or too abstract, too useful? Or has the tension between the ruling majoritarianism versus the desired pluralism, does this have a similar structure? And here, uh, from here I jump to an earlier work of mine that I did in 2007. This is Burak here. Uh, and uh, that was mainly about the uh, uh, different forms of representation, political representation, mathematical re representation, and artistic representation. Uh, what the project was about is uh, at that time, I went into the website of the uh, Turkish parliament and downloaded all the pictures of the members of the parliament and uh, I wrote a program that would statistically extract features of them and once you get in front of the camera, your face was built, uh, merely represented by those other images. So that would be like a picture of majoritarianism in that case. Uh, and these are some, uh, some of the still images that I did for testing. Uh, and one observation was, of, of course, uh, for women, it was much less, much more ghosty. Uh, so that was just to give an idea. Uh, and there are other versions that I did in Mexico with a split screen because the parliament and the House of Representatives uh, had to be uh, illustrated both. And for Korea, that's a picture of my, my, my here. Um, <laughs> now, so that was one thing, and another related concept uh, was something we have seen a lot in the recent uh, in the recent days. That was conspiracy theories, and uh, if you look at the uh, psychological ground of conspiracy theories, even without thinking, just by mere observation in the last month. There's two main things. One of them is projection, 
attribution of undesirable characteristics of the self to the conspirators. And the other one, epistemic bias, expectation for a significant event to have a significant cause. So that's also um, the base for this kind of uh, phenomena called apophenia, uh, where you see meaningful patterns in, in what we see. And a form of apophenia is pareidolia, which is a perception of images or sounds that are, in fact, random, but we give meaning to them. And a related project I did was Faces on Mars here, uh, which, uh, in which I downloaded uh, thousands of pictures. Actually, the whole Google Mars, uh, I scanned it and downloaded all images and then ran a face recognition program on it and found 100 fa faces on Mars. Uh, and uh, it was either presented as a screen or prints. So each time the face that was uh, recognized by the computer was uh, marked. The starting point was actually there was a face of Mars, face on Mars, which was later uh, in another angle uh, found to be nothing, just a shadow play. Uh, so these are other images like that. Now jumping to the other part of the uh, part of my uh, narrative uh, is the program memory. That's what makes computer instructions or code different than different from natural language. Uh, so that's also something we have seen a lot in the uh, in the few in the last month, I would say. Uh, now, some argue, some media theoreticians argue that code is the only language that is executable. There exists no word in an ordinary language which does what it says. No description of a machine of a machine. I'm sorry. No description of a machine sets the machine into motion. So descriptions are different than actions, as we have seen. Uh, but if you have program memory, if you have data in there, actually, once you read it, you are doing an action. Uh, but I would say, uh, with all the excitement during the Gezi protests, we have seen opposite cases, and maybe we need to go back to all these language theories about, uh, I'm not going anything, uh, anything deep into theories like uh, J.L. Austin's uh, performative language and all these things. But uh, my observation, my simple observation was that on uh, Twitter, on Facebook, the images uh, create a big impact. Uh, some of them were just meant to create desire and, ex uh, and attracted people to join the protests, like uh, to say how peaceful and fun and smart they are, or sometimes how sweet they are, like this case is the mothers forming a chain around the uh, park, or sometimes the violence uh, put people into action. Uh, and another uh, kind of thing where symbols or uh, speech turn into action was also related to the positive feedback that we talked before. When the prime minister talked, people wanted more democracy. But when he talked, he became more authoritarian. So people wanted more democracy. So there was kind of like this explosion uh, that we could see. Uh, so uh, that was one part of uh, the connection between symbols and reality. And in fact, uh, if we look at technology, also uh, we talk about the hybridization of media in the last decade. Like in this, uh, in this image, we see more and more in our cell phones, uh, more augmented reality uh, applications. The space is filled with information now. Uh, so 
taking all this together, I went. I had a re uh, look at my uh, previous work, where uh, there is a gallery installation of little uh, pistons installed on the walls that were connected to Twitter. And each time a word, like in this case, order, was mentioned at that time that would hit the wall on different structures uh, in the space and charge the environment with its sound. So some, some more and some other locations, some other languages. So, so that was for the uh, for the performative part. I'm still yeah. Another thing, uh, I jump from subject to subject, but uh, it's about internet memes that uh, in which we also see some form of hybridization. Uh, it's no longer a picture of a cat being distributed and modified, but this time uh, the physical space, what you do in physical space is merged with the pictures to propagate and then goes back to the physical space. So in this case, we have seen many variations of this uh, standing man or also even anti-standing man. Uh, and a lot of have been talked about the humor uh, in, in the protests. Here, the paper gas makes your, literally, makes your skin beautiful. Uh, a lot of people argued, some people argued against humor. Some people said it's, it's a good strategy to interrupt the performance of power or, or fight the flow of this information, which is in fact also a very, uh, some of the few traditions I follow myself as an art, artistic strategy as well, uh, to do both, both interrupt and, uh, and also uh, fight the flow of this information in that case. But of course, uh, in the protest that was combined with what I saw, three different uh, traditions. One of them is the political cartoon tradition in Turkey, which has deep roots, I think. The other one is a newer web culture. And the other one is the football fan culture. Uh, and the slogan making becomes so creative, I think, was partially uh, the younger people are uh, more used to expressing themselves in short sentences and in a really quick manner in like uh, media like Twitter. Uh, so uh, that also uh, made them more practical. Um, I'm jumping <coughs> ahead to the last project. Um, now, a last project that I want to mention is called a uh, pan emoticon that I did in a collaboration with a musician, John Priestley. Uh, that was a project when uh, we decided to do something with uh, sound and I came up with the concept of, uh, of a software as a Firefox extension that would track your movements, your mouse movements, and uh, extract uh, mood, your mood out of the uh, mouse movements. So in many psychology exper uh, experiments, uh, mood is represented by three components, the valence, arousal, and dominance. Uh, so for example, if you move the mouse very abruptly, back and forth, you could be tense, and all these things, this uh, self-learning software try to guess how you feel without logging in in any, uh, any website and showing the dystopic potential of this uh, technology, although it's not uh, you know, scientifically doing the job really, but as a gesture, it's showing this potential. Uh, and again, coming back to the prism issue, since uh, we are not there yet in Turkey, but uh, I'm sure they wished we would be doing this. Uh, and also, 
since we talk a lot about Twitter, Facebook as uh, being as uh, kind of being our allies in in these protests, that uh, is actually a temporary ally for us. Um, so going back to the beginning, uh, just uh, I threw I tried to throw out all these terms and kind of reflect my what I've been thinking in the last in the last week actually because before that uh, I was pretty much thinking about only one thing uh, so just uh, the idea that how we can use a different language in this case the language of technology but it can be any new language that enters the culture uh, and retell our stories or memories based on the, this newly acquired experiences. That's it. Discussion maybe um, from uh, UC's talk, uh, he used this term uh, archival moment, and I think it's an interesting uh, term. Um, it reminds me uh, this moment uh, that we all lived probably during the past month, which is uh, when you get a message on your email or Twitter account somewhere, and um, and let's say, let's say there's a call for action. It, 7 p.m. at Taksim Square, da, da, da. and we get this message from uh, this media, let's say it's called Twitter, and we go to that location physically, and then be there, you know, with our body and everything, with our friends, and then uh, things happen, uh, let's say a police intervention or something, and we take pictures and then send to the same medium back, right? A photograph, for instance, or a note, a message that things are happening here, and then other people see that, um, image or message and then they maybe they come to the square maybe half an hour later or, or they, they distribute this moment uh, to their friends and in, in, in put into circulation it's a bit like a feedback loop that you described in general Ali. and also uh, I wonder if this is an archival moment is it <laughs> like this, this feedback loop that we are in and which generates all the kind of explosion of uh, events and and I don't know, maybe you see, can you talk about this a little bit? This, not like a co question, but more like a comment. Yeah, that, that's good. And it kind of, it, I mean, I want to connect it to what we just heard with the two presentations as well. I mean, archival moment is a way of actually, and what you just described is a good way of looking at, again, this, you know, my media theoretical hat on, but also in relation to concrete events, to the various temporalities at play during, for instance, past four weeks, and kind of from a social thinking about the event and, and kind of a, a how it restructures rhythms of everyday life to actual technological infrastructures in which it happens. You know, the very quick temporalities of technological software um, and, 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 and how it modulates our perception. I like your piece where you kind of, the, the, the parliament piece, for instance, because it's about the software enabled perception and, and, and so forth. Um, so in that sense, yeah, but archival moment is probably kind of something that actually extends to so many temporal directions, from the really micro-temporal software event um, to, to the kind of questions, how do we extend that event on top from you know, technical software level into something that we can say that is a cultural memory um, on a long-term basis as well. And that's kind of, in a way, is probably something that, you know, it's, it makes Kurenev's project as well interesting, but it's got exactly that fancy of the universal extended archive of 
not only of archival of life, but also the archival of post-life after 1948, when that the reality is surpassed and, and you can extend this digital realm. Um, but what is interesting is how you do that into material thing, right? Statistics. Do you, does anyone, will you pick up on any of the ideas about archival moment of temporality? So Um, then we take like more let's questions. Maybe add something. Oh, okay. I have a basic question because I, I'm quite confused. I mean, in, in the traditional uh, definition of what an archive is, what it constitutes, it's a filter, it's a structure basically um, that is um, that needs to be as neutral as possible, but it's always controlled by somebody. If not the archivist, then it's the state, you know, that uh, keeps the archive open or uh, makes it very difficult to enter. So. Um, and it seems to me that everything what we are trying to describe here with um, technology like Twitter, Facebook, um, and now I'm also seeing how actually I've been using my Facebook myself in order to try to archive my experiences and to make sense of it. Um, but uh, it's all very nice that it's so uh, open, uh, decentered, but it doesn't constitute an archive. It's, it's, it's I mean, in, in the traditional sense, it's, it's, a co it's a collection, basically. And for it to be an archive, it needs an, a, a moment afterwards when you start to um, look at the collection again and you need to filter it uh, in order to abstract information from it that can be, uh, can be used again or can be uh, useful to somebody in the future. That was what you were also describing, Lucy. So, uh, but it seems to me, th th thinking about this archival moment, that the technology has increased the speed of, uh, of, of, uh, of uh, structuring uh, uh, or, or creating a structure or a grid already on top of the collection that we make, um, but there's a huge danger. The danger in that it can also be again manipulated or how do you say manipulative uh, because of that structure that we don't have the complete uh, control over. I mean, uh, thinking of, for instance, how we can use different <coughs> kinds of uh, structures of blocks and, and how that then these blocs can, uh, cannot be always immediately connected. I mean, it, 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 I, th I think there's a huge danger of this, this idea of the decentered archive or the, or, the, or the speed of the archival moments that we are losing sort of the, the control over, over uh, of the information that we process and that it actually becomes uh, very blurry and very difficult to uh, use that information afterwards. That's a comment, but I don't know if, it, if anybody can say about because I'm not an expert on uh, this thing, but uh, archive and collection to me seems very, very uh, separate things, and we are now confusing things too much. Yeah, I completely agree, actually. I mean, it's in terms of that there's a, which again connects to the presentations. There's, there's a couple of conflations that go on quite easily, and you just pointed out one, that we brand everything as an archive that has to do with the storage of, or, or collecting, right? So the archival, one could say, happens on a very different level because the archival, as you just pointed out, has to do with concrete, you know, prescribed pre um, classifications and the archival logic that has to be templated across any data, right? But that's already done by, you know, for, for instance, platform for us. So the way in which we curate information, for instance, on timelines, is in that sense a different mode of archiving, so to speak, or even not archiving. And on a kind of historical level, what's interesting, and people like Wendy Chan in software studies would point out that there's a kind of danger how we have traditionally conflated storage and memory, okay? The idea which comes from, you know, our metaphors of computer memory as well. The idea that, you know, computer memory is storage and so forth. They're actually, these two things, there's a kind of a, on a technical level as well, I'm not uh, somebody who should be talking about technical things, like I usually get it wrong, but uh, any kind of memory is in itself have to be regenerative. There has to be also always, and that's a kind of technical feature as well, memory is regenerated all the time. There's no stable memory as a storage, as like permanent place. And that, of course, has to do with any kinds of computer memory as well. There's a processes that are, in that sense, energetic, because they have to do with regeneration, right? So it's interesting to see that there would be, again, a kind of political ontology behind this idea that all memory has to be constantly regenerated as well. That's kind of perhaps relates to what you just said, but I don't know whether, yeah. 
I was kind of also seeing it in, in this source, this idea about you know, political ontology behind the um, metaphors and practices of memory. Yeah, even uh, for example, uh, when we talked about this standing man, uh, if we imagine we don't have any, uh, any cameras and uh, that would survive only by repeating it. And that's also a form of memory in that sense. Exactly. That's a good example as well of how to really preserve that as a kind of a cultural practice. And in a way, yeah. Mm. I, I don't know if it responds to your comment, but uh, I was thinking of a, a friend of mine who is a statistician. And uh, she was working for a training center for women in computing, but that could have happened elsewhere. And uh, she was uh, responsible for basically um, the management of the, the personnel. And uh, she was always giving me the example of uh, um, the repurposability, I don't know com how to say, the fact that data can be repurposed endlessly. And uh, she was called, calling this sleeping data. And the example she was giving was uh, that on the, uh, when the, 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 the people would enter a, a room, a classroom, uh, they would start the computers and um, also the, the connection to the, the router would be logged. And uh, it was very useful for managing the firewalls, seeing the, the uh, how the, the, the internal uh, network would function and so on and so forth. And then one day she said, with my background in statistics, what I see in this data is a way to control um, the, the professors in the classroom. I know when they start the class. Um, and so uh, for me, that's really where um, our notion of um, uh, the archival moment, where, when, when is it archival? Is it when the information is stored? Is it when it's repurposed and the correlation is made? And correlation can be done all the time? Or is it when somehow there is a connection between a certain concept or a certain technique and the data? Because for, for a long time, nobody had seen this data with the eye of a statistician. And, and um, that's why I think for me it's very difficult to say what an archive is because I think we are really in, in um, like this, this possibility to repurpose everything into endless correlations. Um, I mean, um, it's, it's really, it was of course possible before. I mean, the, the 20th century is full of um, important political decisions based on statistics. referenced, uh, correlated, um, yeah, it gives another dimension to all the data that are lying somewhere. Mm. And this is a footnote, because there was something that came to my mind during your Nicola presentation as well, is that, you know, like media archaeologists like Wolfgang Ernst, they might point out that, you know, even etymologically, actually, what we should be looking at is the way in which we usually think about archives has to do with symbolic meanings and narration as in text and textual archives. But there's actually the other etymology having to do with narration um, in certain languages, like German, and, and, and then going to calculation and counting. Narration as counting points back to the etymological roots of statistics and numbers that actually are, in a way, returning now that we're in, in you know, software archives. And that brings a whole, you know, whole framework in which we can start thinking about non-narrative in that, in that traditional sense, non-narrated or perhaps differently narrated archives that are statistical, that you just elaborated with the Koronelia example. And um, I can see the resonances there as well in Ali's work. I see very clearly a point because I'm studying history and historiography. In historiography also, we have the same problem 
but in 19th century there is uh, another in that discipline there are, there are other branches like history from law so you see the diaries um, from ordinary people so maybe that that discipline also will have the same branches later on Um, I don't know if this is a question, but it's um, maybe uh, mostly to you. Um, a, a utopic wondering about um, how these forms are taking place now. And I know I hear from different people that uh, different parks have a different vibe to them and um, they uh, form their own languages on how to um, com contract or react or uh, talk about things. Um, for example, there was the first day, there was only um, like five minutes for everyone to talk and then it became like two minutes and then uh, it started being like, if there's a, a like nobody was to like, was to talk face to face about or like um, uh, argue on any subject, but then um, different and interesting issues started coming up and people started like uh, we needed a moderator there and then it started out like um, okay this is a this is a good point we need to talk about this a little bit more so some uh, dialogues became longer and uh, so it's changing all the time like the needs of the forum and like maybe it's changing over time and it's changing uh, due to um, like uh, the actual democratic uh, needs uh, that ha like uh, makes people come together and uh, tries to keep them together there. So I was wondering if um, do you think that uh, this kind of uh, like an organic um, what do you call uh, in interaction between people may actually become in. Uh, in the computer world, in the digital world, like um, continue from this point and um, become maybe a, like a, a base for kind of an open democracy. I don't exactly know what it means, how uh, what open democracy is actually, but um, and like since it needs a moderator any, anyhow, how objective can it be and how uh, repetitions can be avoided because. Um, they're like in forums, like nobody is able to um, stay up for like till five o'clock in the morning and listen to everyone and everyone uh, don't know what everyone has told. So there are a lot of repetitions going on also. So how, like um, there is a very, and, and also like I feel uh, in the utopic sense that um, if this uh, grows and if it lives in the digital uh, arena also, it, you might actually uh, form a government of your, for yourself uh, because it all uh, encompasses the help, um, the social need, like needs and everything within itself. So um, uh, do you think that this is possible or like do, um, is there is there I don't know like um, ways that people are trying to take this language to the digital? Uh, yeah, I mean, th there have been people uh, talking about this actually to uh, develop projects, online projects, to uh, kind of make this attempt on forums more substantial. Uh, but uh, it's a very new idea at this point and I see uh, both advantages and disadvantages of being in a physical space like uh, biggest advantage to me is you can build a real community I uh, rather uh, prefer not to call online communities as communities uh, but on the other hand it's more efficient uh, to do things online if you uh, need to make a decision or uh, to give more structure to the discussions. Uh, so I think they have both, uh, there's a trade-off. Uh, but uh, I think uh, for direct democracy, uh, 
the, the digital technologies can be a hope. I'm, uh, I'm thinking positively, optimistically about that. I think what Ali showed today, uh, these feedback loops, uh, some of them are negative, some of them are positive. You know, negative feedback usually uh, makes optimization in any system, in an ecosystem, and positive feedback generates, uh, I guess, energy or chaos or just enlarges things in general. And what is needed, I feel, in general, in the solidarity context, uh, is the positive feedback within people. You know, uh, that will generate explosion even more. Uh, so any tool, any digital or hybrid digital physical tool that can enable that would be quite useful in general, I, I believe. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, should we finish it now? Uh, we will continue tomorrow at 7 p.m. Uh, and it will be shorter in terms of presentations, only myself and your chef. And then we will do more discussions We'll try to do more discussions in that way. Okay, thanks for coming.